Well, people, we're almost done and we're through the worst of it. Though it's a bit yet before we reach the series' end game. Episode 37 introduces the last significant heroic character, which is revealed as a random kid friend of Yuji's is being bullied for... absolutely no reason. For the love of- STOP SHOUTING YOUR LINES! Anyways, this kid finds a key which inexplicably has the O-Rangers emblems arranged on it. And I do say inexplicably, as that was a design Miura made that is not from the Super Ancient Civilization, nor does it actually relate to them. For upon holding it, it summons to him a tiki head which speaks to him the way to open it. Buddy? Oh, it's you. This is the magic genie warrior Gun Majin. And yes, it is Majin, not Mazin, because the allusion to Gun Majin's name is to Majin, as in Dijin or Genie, as Majin is another word for Genie. Though it also doubles as one of their many words for demon. There's also a city in Iran, a village in China, a giant pig man from Dragon Ball, and part of the descriptive title for the Imajin from Deno that Surprise, surprise, those last two were also based on genies to emphasize that. As established before, I'm a bit neurotic on the Jay-Z romanization thing due to Toei's propensity for English. The gun part has also been questioned on whether it should be gun, meaning face, since gun Majin is, well, a tiki head genie. As such, he will grant one wish to the person who found him, as long as it's in his power and doesn't conflict with his personal morals. And we already saw how well that went in the movie already. Though apparently those morals allow him to attack defenseless children. Our heroes, ladies and gentlemen! And this kid has one simple wish. He wants to take a ride in O-Blocker. Unfortunately, Gun Majin's not of the you wish it and now it's yours a variety of Majin. He actively works to complete his master's wishes in any way he can, as is revealed by Riki when he tells of the entity. But even in the super ancient civilization's time, he was an abnormality, as he predates even them. He's just a complete and utter mystery and ultimately a wild card. Shown as he attacks and kidnaps Yuji in some scheme to get O-Blocker from him. This, I think, since Sugimura is writing this two-parter, was his attempt to actualize his take on the genie plot he was prevented from doing back in Zoo Ranger by Shinichiro Shirakura. That wishes from omnipotent entities almost always ends up twisted from what you actually desire but that's weakened by there being a very easy way to mediate this whole conflict with Gun Machine. Let the kid ride in O-Blocker. For like this, no matter how well-intentioned the wish, Gun Machine is an unneeded antagonist while they still have Baranoia to deal with. It's a small act which easily resolves this and gets this entity out of everyone's hair, as by this point even the kid understands what's going on is bad, especially since... <laughs> Yeah, that's a lie. You steal its key from its current holder, new master, new wish. But instead of that, Bulldogs and Bomber learn of Gun Majin and scheme to claim him for themselves, Bomber attempting coercion before getting the key, but after finding his wish, Conquest of Earth... Hey, Bomber, you haven't secured your rule over Baranoia yet. How about you wish for that? is something Gun Majin won't help him with as it breaks his morals to try and kill people. So he reseals himself, and Bulldog gets the key. He makes the same wish as the kid, using fake crocodile tears to fool Gun Majin and helping him get O-Blocker. I ask why he didn't just wish back his dad, but obviously from everything presented, Gun Majin's not supposedly to have that kind of power. That's the only time he shows that kind of power ever. But it's not a good idea to trick a near omnipotent being, as once they learn of the deception, they tend to get pissed. <laughs> Thus, he's sent flying back to the moon, with Gun Majin resettling himself and disappearing, to be seen later. Still, Bulldog's absence has permitted Bomber the time to more secure his coup, using a rule in their constitution... Uh, they're a monarchy, 
why would they have a constitution? Hell, Bacchus was their first emperor. Why would he have rules that circumvent right of succession? Well, the rule involves a trial of combat. And obviously, considering Boldon's build, he doesn't have the power to face Bomber, let alone the voice of the God of Destruction. Severed head, take a drink. I've been marathoning Highlander. <laughs> yeah, kind of a bad episode title when that happens before the title card. Hysteria is banished on a missile with bull on severed head, leaving Bomber in full control. And as such, Bomber begins his new world conquest scheme. Get it? Because the royal family's names were all based on dogs, and it's foreshadowed irony for later? This gold dog reveals itself to have a beam attack that acts like a Midas touch. Plotting in amongst humans does the work for Bomber, and lets their own greed do the rest of the work to sow chaos, and for it to draw power from their desire to not only grow bigger, but the beam to use is stronger, with Shohei's legs hit by the blast, which renders him out of commission, and its various worshippers ultimately giving him the power to turn the entire world into nothing but guild. And this is why Akira Toriyama created Super Saiyan Blue. Because ever since the Frieza arc, Japan's been obsessed with golden forms and golden powers being the super final extra sparkle, mega survive, maxi combo, shining, whatever you may call it. I actually really like this plot not just because of the lampshade hanging of that obsession, but from how simple a scheme played entirely straight can be so destructive. As is what most of the more asinine Baranoia plots have been trying to do but failed to show because of their diversions or character idiocy. How superior mechanical life is because they lack the imperfections organics do by turning their more negative aspects against themselves. And for once, thanks to the goldifying beam, the orange are appropriately thrown off their game and crippled. However, this is all to eat time, for as Hysteria drifts in space, she is drawn towards another world. Though how she got out that far is baffling, since this could have just been a secret installation on the moon. And it would make more sense to be a secret installation on the moon, because the one drawing them there is Bacchus Wrath. Oops, server dead, take a drink. Though this begs the question of if he survived no blocker destroying him, then why did he not rebuild his body? Someone or thing had to have happened across him to set him up in this lab, and in this stasis tube. Okay, now I'm just having weird flashbacks to that episode of Zeo where Mondo appears in Zordon's energy tube. Now, Rangers, observe the robot apocalypse! Anyways, he reveals he doesn't have long to live. I presume the damage he's taken prevents him from just uploading into a new body. But Bulldog's core memory is otherwise fine, meaning they can rebuild him. Faster. Stronger. Less of a weenie! Which the pair get to doing, all while Bomber makes plans to build his castle out of all of the gold his little big doggies have made for him. Starting with the helpless humans. Shuichi, the kid whose mom started all of this with her greed, however, stumbles across Gunmajin and his key, leading to Gunmajin rescuing Shohei as he's about to have his body smelted like the T-1000, a while Riki counters the dog with King Pyramider. Which makes me ask the question of, what would happen if this thing was facing something that was already gold? But all it does is reveal its true nature as a machine beast. This prompts the others to call in the other O-Ranger mecha to finally destroy the eyes that cause it to engold and everything. So, for the first time in the series, all of the O-Ranger's Megazords are united on the battlefield at the same time. However, as Bomber falls into retreat, Gunma Jean blocks him meaning that everyone that is his enemy now surrounds him, including... <laughs> WHO THE FUCK ARE YOU?! Yeah, this sends everybody for a loop. This is Multiwa, 
a gynoid, that has inherited Hysteria's power, as she gave it up when they were rebuilding Bulldance. And she is Bulldance's previously unheard of fiancé. I hand waved it as an arranged marriage. But yes, now that he's been upgraded, it's more than time they met on the battlefield. Multiwath swearing allegiance to the newly revealed Kaiser Bulldaunt. Bomber flees from the combined onslaught, with the power couple choosing to spend some time kicking the O-Rangers' asses before finally confronting the Bomb Man to take from him their pound of steel. <laughs> eh, it's no Sekiha love love Tenkyoken, but it gets the job done. And Bulldaunt has a special form of revenge planned for Bomber. He's going to use him as a washing machine. Now, they reprogram him with Multiwa's Lavu Lavu Beam to be loyal to them, and they sick him on the O-Ranger by replacing limbs they destroyed with more weapons he uses to devastate the city. There's such severity that even the blocker robos are forced back. However, as they attack, Bomber begins to resist the reprogramming, the Clash for Control giving them enough time to switch tactics and insert the O-Blocker into King Pyramider to make King Pyramider Super Battle Formation. It's actually not named that, but it should be. That does him in. <laughs> Obligatory reference to Nobuyuki Hiyama's career. But even then, he has a backup, launching a missile from his, erm, um, back, that is aimed at the sun to destroy it with a supernova. Tch, <laughs> good luck with that. If a magic immortal phoenix that becomes stronger every time it dies can't escape from the sun... <sighs> then I doubt whatever bomb is in that is going to do it in. Or even create more than a massive solar flare that could possibly scorch the Earth. Okay, it still could work for killing everything on Earth, just not as explained. So how will they stop it? Gunma Jean is seen on the sidelines, with him being wished upon to stop the missile. Earth saved! Well, for now. As in the Empire, Boldont and Multiwa are married, with the now Silver Hysteria looking on, as the ceremony is broadcast to Earth. The war has now entered its final stage. And this was an excellent shift in the show paradigm to that coming endgame, too. And as such, it's time for more filler. Technically. Which begins with the O-Ranger being lured out by child abductions. Get ready for a surprise! <laughs> Thus, the lot are ambushed and beaten down by the power couple, while the onlooking Doreen ends up being used as a hostage against them to leave them defenseless to the onslaught on threat of her dying. Because Doreen is useless and her only role in the show is to endanger herself and others. And I think this is the second biggest example of that. As everyone but Riki is captured, Doreen uses her connection to nature, that she suddenly just has, to find the O-Ranger. But instead of informing people that can actually do shit about this, she goes herself, on her own, and stands in front of Goro as he's about to be attacked by Bara Hunter, who is using him as prey. This act, if Riki did not intervene out of literal nowhere to prevent it, would not only not prevent Goro from dying from Bara Hunter, but would instead pointlessly add another fatality. She didn't even bring Goro his power brace, which the Core 5 had lost following her being held hostage before. No, all her actions do is result in Riki being injured, which in her grief at causing all this then makes her completely double down on her own damn errors and release a cursed evil magic sword that was sealed within King Pyramider. Why is there a cursed evil magic sword inside of an Egyptian pyramid-shaped science machine from 600 million years before the dawn of man? God, I need a new job! As I was saying, because Doreen is stupid enough to unseal this artifact they somehow inexplicably have now, you really can tell Hirohisa Soda was writing this one, Reiki is cursed by this forbidden power. Is it Kage Mamoru, Khajiit, or the Debug? If anyone gets that reference, you deserve the highest of fives. 
But yeah, with the Cursed Sword, Riki loses his mind, and only tangentially succeeds in freeing the others before Doreen undoes her most massive of fuck-ups that is killing her personal guardian with a flower. A flower. And not even a real flower, but a magic fake illusionary manifestation of a flower. That is not in any way explained why it might have a calming effect, on someone cursed with this sword! You used unneeded deus ex machina to fight unneeded deus ex machina! And you ended this on a scene that caused me to have Kamen Rider Tyson flashbacks. You can understand why I hate this one, and continue my streak of calling out certain characters for their bullshit, as it's never once recognized that they were ever at fault in the first place. Anyways, Barra Fraud, in the disguise of an old swindler, sells adults a crystal ball that hypnotizes them into thinking they are their younger selves. The Oranger tipped off to this because it hits the Sheeta family. Which should immediately tip you off to this being both a horror episode and a bad one. Which leads to it immediately revealing itself, due to, in its escape, the tracks it leaves behind in the ground denoting its inhumanity, and it summarily captures Goro, Yuji, and Momo when they follow it in soap bubbles. This is what happens when you get fired up, Ninja. With the effects of its ability spreading, the Oranger go after it undercover, some of whom are in drag. You know, I don't care if there's a theatrical precedent for men dressing up as women to portray given roles, especially within the Japanese cultural context of Kabuki, but in the modern day, it's only ever used as a cheap gag, and cross-dressing is not funny. Frog returns to the Sheetas again and reveals a new orb with a different hypnotic effect, but we're skipping past that to them just cornering the monster and getting rid of it. Though as a consequence, the Sheeta are left homeless as their house is condemned, with a lot of them walking off into the blue to never be seen again. Our heroes, ladies and gentlemen. What makes this worse? The episode's title is The Drunk Card is Seven Changes inferring it's meant to be a quick change episode which leads to the monster's defeat. But aside from the group playing dress-up, which in fact does nothing to curtail the bad guy, that in no way factors into their battling of Barra Fraud. So, in a way, the title was the actual fraud. The penultimate episode before the finale story arc begins has Multiwa take human form in order to use her Levu Levu powers to enchant the male O-Ranger. And because this is a soda script, it turns them into not only horn dogs, because dog pun, but idiots as well as they fall over themselves for her attention. She tries to make them give up what's most important to them to show their love, the intent being to get their power braces, but instead what they bring to her are straight out of left field and not actually relating at all to their characters. Goro's is an ancestral scroll, Shohei's are coupons, and Yuji's is his bank account. You work full-time for the military. What the fuck are you spending your paycheck on? Again, their day job is full-time work through military service as the O-Ranger. So their job as Heroes of Justice should literally be paying their fucking bills. THIS JOKE DOESN'T MAKE ANY SENSE! This is again evidence of Soda ignoring the series he's writing for for the sake of the story's diversions, and a precursor, again, of the crap that would end up pulled with Car Ranger, as Multiwa's charm skill wears off past this joke. The deception is revealed, the couple overpowering everyone again, only for Momo to find an unsealed gun Majin so he can help. <laughs> Well, way to throw your teammates under the bus, Momo. Actually, behind the scenes, she was doing that all the fucking time. It'd be a different thing entirely if they were all still enchanted or disabled, but they're right fucking there! And as established, Momo's the worst member of the O-Ranger. They, of course, end up incapacitated, 
only for Multiwa's Lovu Lovu Beam to be defeated by the power of Hiroshi Miyayuchi. And thus, we come to the final four-part finale for the series, with Bulldog sending a worm-like creature down to Earth, and it being seen by Mikio. Again. So he would have no actual point in the episodes. Goro wakes up the next day to find his alarm clock going crazy, which is a precursor to every machine on the planet going nuts and acting as if it were sentient. This is the plot to Maximum Overdrive. Actually, Bar Bar here from Vs. Cockranger, I'm amazed Baranoi didn't start the series by implementing this plan. As, boom, series over, all tech used by the Human Resistance turns against the Human Resistance. This should not have been doable at all by them, by the way, specifically because of that fridge logic destroying perception of them as competent villains if they had this win button from the start and just did not use it. You don't do that! Or at least if you do it, you explain why they could not do it before this. New technology required a rare power source. It having been in planning but just took time to prepare. The Orange's Choriki power was an unexpected wild card, so they didn't want to until it had been analyzed. Or it could just as easily be used against the Baranoia themselves and have them lose control of their own forces. Something would need to be said about why this wasn't an option before. Mira starts an analysis of what's going on, and sure enough, they find what's going on is finally Baranoia using some form of Nana. You mean dark matter? Dark matter wouldn't cause this. <sighs> so many of these plots will be justified by nanites, but no! Bulldog's forces make planetfall, with the O-Ranger unable to deploy in the mechs as they just end up controlled. But with everyone put in danger, and this being written by the last competent writer on the show, they have no choice but to do so. With the one behind this, Barra Micron, summarily using its control beam on not just O-Blocker, but Red Puncher. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I give you... DANCING ROBOTS! See? First time it was fun, now it elicits horror. The mechs overload, forcing the O-Ranger onto foot, where they are similarly overwhelmed. Micron's ray is also showing to affect and disable their power braces. And to turn up the we're so screwed, from accessing O-Blocker systems, they find UAO's base and begin a siege on it as well. To save the other mechs, Mira sends them down to the Choriki power generator deep under the facility as it collapses around him. The group goes on the lam as Baranoia begins to route the populace into work camps, Mikio forwarding a message about the mechs being safe for when the counterattack comes, only for Shohei and Yuji to be captured and used as bait for the others, which Momo falls for and summarily drags down Jury with her for anyone who continues to complain about me calling Momo too incompetent to be assigned to a team of elite soldiers. Pyramider and Riki appear, finally, to try and stop Micron. Where have you been, dude? But instead of focusing on the cause of this situation, Riki goes down to rescue the others and direct them to Pyramider. Which, okay, I can see the idea of regrouping before counterattacking, but there's one problem in attempting that. Goro brought a child into a war zone. Why would you do that? And yes, it's because he dragged Mikio with him instead of getting him to hide that they are delayed from all getting to Pyramider, and thus Pyramider ends up attacked by Micron when everyone that knows anything about piloting it is absent from the mech. And yes, absent. Because once again, Doreen runs into danger after Riki summarily loses his powers, so can't actually help him from the thing that could have distracted anyone attacking him. Meaning, in this specific moment, they have now lost! DO SEX MAKINA NO JUTSU! Oh, 
クリスタルおねがいゆきとオレンジをたすけてバナミクロン I don't even... I can't... I can't... What just happened? It kills Baramicron, so much for earning your victories, but also sends Pyramider creating into space, thus preventing it from routing the rest of Baranoia Strike Force if they could get back to it to use its weapons. And as a result, leaves Doreen once more helpless and unprotected. So her carelessness and recklessness finally leads her to getting killed thanks to an arrow from Multiwa. And to think, as she stayed in Pyramider, None of this, nor the complete subjugation of Earth, would have even happened. I'm beginning to think the super agent civilization's fall may have been her fault. Bullshit, she is. Again, bullshit. Doreen is not a nature spirit. Doreen is not the spirit of the Earth. Doreen is not intrinsically tied to Choriki power either before this or when they, after this, explain what Choriki power is, which is the power birthed from the bonds between all life. And she has been in another dimension for 600 million years before this, and while she was, both nature and Choriki power functioned just fine. She is not tied to any of these things. She is instead the reason why this bad situation has now become unsalvageable. The only thing she could have done was use her unexplained elf powers to remove the damage done to the power brace, but no! Had to defeat the greatest paranoia monster for them, and steal from them, earning their victory against long odds. Well, since they're set into space, might as well double the we're so screwed, with Bulldaunt completely out of nowhere, since Pyramider to another dimension made of fire. It is never explained how he does this, as this is not something within his power to do, nor is it explained how the O-Ranger escape it. Instead, they just end up on Doreen's homeworld, amongst a whole bunch of Doreen's. This being the apparent homeworld of Choriki power, because... I have no idea why she sent them here, as she could have just as easily given them the exposition they're presented here without the trip. <laughs> And as evidenced by every series before this, every series after this, and within this series' own canon, since the Baranoia have conquered half the galaxy without any force of theirs encountering Choriki power anywhere else, you do an absolutely horrific job at that! They fix up Pyramider and tell them how to pilot it, where somehow, some way, it is once again not explained. Despite only being gone a few hours, six months have passed. Paranoia no not an explanation, as Bolon should not have been able to do that, and it's inconsistent with every other use of pocket and alternate dimensions in this show thus far. And before people cite Doreen and Riki's original stasis, no. They were in stasis pods, preserving them while Pyramider waited 600 million years. Dear God, every time I say that number, it gets more ludicrous. Before bringing them back into real space. Time still affected the ship as normal even then. Why are you so bad with time, Noboru Sugimura? In that time, Bulldance built himself a castle, and he and Multiwa had built themselves a kid, Bulldance Jr., who Hysteria spends her time looking after, appearing to, as a... would grandmother be the right term? Having learned to embrace a lot of the organic emotions Bacchus hated. Riki finds the returning O-Ranger and pulls them to the Underground Resistance, and its leader, Mirror. How the fuck are you still alive? You secretly are Owlranger, Big One, V3, or the Magnificent Zubat, aren't you? However, a Baranoia spy in their midst alerts Bulldog to their return, catching Mikio, again, to draw the lot of them out. This, however, shows how absolutely worthless the diversion to Doreen's homeworld actually was, as none of the information given to them on that world actually precipitated what comes next, the realization of what Choriki power actually is, and by proxy, the O-Ranger's greater power, that the power they've used all this time is that of the unconscious will of humanity, the power of the human heart, the human mind, and the human soul. 
a power Baronoia cannot comprehend nor defeat because they are cold-hearted machines. And that would be more effective if the Baronoia actually were emotionless machines. Eh, Bacchus was at least trying, and Bulldog did seem to inherit that. Well, regardless, the Choriki power generator reactivates and recharges the storage crystals, so the lot of them regain their abilities and are back on even footing with Baranoia. Only for Bulldogs and Multiwa to use another child, this time a baby as a hostage, and... This is where Hysteria has an epiphany. What's the difference between that baby Bulldog is threatening to kill and the grandson she is looking after? In the grand scheme of things... There is no difference. And in that moment, she realizes what her empire has done, and what she and Bacchus have turned their son into. Though this once again makes Mikio's involvement redundant since the endangered baby has relevance to the story when he does not. The fight moves to the macro scale, with the O-Ranger fighting the lovers with O-Ranger Robo, as Miura, Riki, and a recovered Gunma Jean storm the Baranoia base to reclaim the captured mechs. And now, finally, the entire O-Ranger arsenal is unleashed upon Bulldogs and Multiwa, ending their threat, though not that of the rest of the Baranoia, since they have not destroyed any of the other forces. Instead, they come to confront Hysteria, who surrenders outright, making one last request. Spare Junior. <laughs> And despite evidence of Bacchus showing leaving any survivor is a bad idea, yeah, you probably should not show your heroes murdering babies. Instead, Baranoia sins will be claimed by Hysteria, and they are ones she takes to her grave. Though to keep Junior from plotting revenge, he, Acha, and Kocha are placed under the guardianship of Gan Manjin, who swears to make the little one grow up right, and into a benign robotic entity. That is as long as they can get him the part to keep upgrading what form he's in, cause I'd hate to think of what it'd be like to be stuck as a baby for your entire existence. <sighs> and thus, peace is found between organic and synthetic life, meaning this series too has a better ending than Mass Effect 3. Doreen's revived by the other space elves and runs off with Riki into the sunset, as the rest go back to their jobs in the military, with the team being officially unofficially disbanded, as they get to help with rebuilding efforts that'd be done when the next series premiered anyways. And that was Choriki Sentai O-Ranger. Remember how good its first nine episodes were? As far as I'm concerned, O-Ranger's a middle-of-the-road Sentai that could have been far better had the issues of Sugimura's other years been properly mediated, and it not been derailed with all the other bad stuff that befell it. Most of the direction is quite good. The effects work was top-notch for 1995, scene integration was really effective, and as I said, this show has some of the best mecha designs for years, both of the Megazords and Baranoia's own forces. I just love most of them. It sadly once again fails to really develop the cast as unique individuals, or have non-caustic focus on them much of the time, especially with the writer discourse either dragging them in a direction that is ignored the rest of the time, or not bothering to focus on them in favor of those that do not matter, nor ever matter to the story. It had a great start, and mixed in with the bad, there's enough good interim tales that the series isn't a total write-off, as I liked the plot with Kuroda, I was interested in the Riki stuff before they once again decided to treat him as superfluous, the Baranoia's motivations, while hypocritical, were understandable and complex due to their nature. The series had a lot going for it, even amongst the utterly stupid, unnecessarily comically focused execution of a lot of the ideas. And really, all you need to do to avoid the real bad stuff is to skip the filler episodes beginning in the 20s. Though you'll still be stuck with the suck of Buster O-Ranger Robo and O-Blocker's debuts in that, as it's hard to skip every episode Hirohisa Soda wrote for the show. And it's kind of sad it's gotten the reputation of being so awful when it isn't, since, well, this is the last series to feature contributions from so many of the Showa era's writers for Sentai. And in a way, it's the last send-off to that era and its writing stylization. The respectful one, at any rate. 
Despite my disdain for many plots unnecessarily including children in the tales, I do respect their contributions to everything in bringing Sentai this far. And while things would begin to change heavily with Mega Ranger and Ginga Man, there's nonetheless merit in those years that, sadly due to time and the creatively tapped out state of those involved in those years, the stories here barely reflected that greatness. And as its own thing, the show wasn't able to accomplish much of its own story due to the derailment it suffered. More than anything else, O-Ranger is a victim of circumstances beyond its control, and that's why it's very much hard for me to hate it, given those facts. Though clearly I can still be irritated with it, which I am at points. And I didn't mean to make it a recurring condemnation of Momo and Doreen's actions negatively affecting the team, but when you do look over the show, the exact same thing does keep happening. Momo's captured due to incompetence, and Doreen endangers herself and others. Wash, rinse, repeat, without any character growth for them. Which is especially not good considering Momo's actress, Tamao Sato, acted like an egotistical bitch during production of the show, to the point even Hiroshi Miyuchi was pissed at her, and went around publicly deriding Tokusatsu as a whole as nothing more than kid shows. Which, if you've seen my irritants at that write-off that only serves as an excuse to dismiss and disrespect the better content and for people to write badly, well, you've not seen Japan retaliate for such. Tamao Sato, at the time, was a very popular idol with her own show on Japanese MTV, and she had her career destroyed for her conduct behind the scenes once people were made aware of them. Methinks some of the dumbass and distressing was in retaliation for her being a diva. I intentionally left this fact for the end so it wouldn't color the character during the review. It's amazing after rebuilding her reputation, she bothered to return for All Rangers tribute episode in Gokaiger. Though with how poorly used the characters were for much of the series, it's hard to blame her for wanting non-caustic screen time which was at the root of her complaints. Riki never got enough focus to develop, Yuji was made a butt monkey to often learn anything, and Shohei, Goro, and Juri never needed to change, but by proxy we end up learning little about them, with Shohei given the most thanks to the Boxer subplot. It's in many respects the same problem Zoo Ranger suffered, in that outside of the backstory of the show, or unless it was tied to some special monster of the week, they are for the most part flat characters. And as that was what was many people's problems from going from Jetman, a character-focused and driven series, to Sugimura's years where the main characters would often be an afterthought. And as the show was originally trying to echo Jetman in stylistic respects, well, it's easy to see another way how they failed here. But at least there's a reason why that is, and that's from Toei shifting them back to focus on children-centric plots that throttled character stories in their sleep. Miura is the only one that really avoids this, since he was able to get a character-focused episode before the show was forced to become something else. So, honestly, I think I watched it more for the villains by the end, as at least they had something interesting going on. But no matter the justification, excuse, or explanation I can give, O-Ranger at the end of the day is a mess, and that mess does show why its ratings fell so low. And as Car Ranger kept them that low for most of its run until Toei's executives washed their hands of it too, it's obvious they didn't learn the lesson that should have come from this series. No matter how serious or silly, mature or juvenile you make the show you are producing, it won't matter if the underlying story isn't well written. And as many of Toei's shows both before and after this have shown, it's a lesson they either haven't learned or need to be retaught cyclically every so often. And as such, allow me next week to take you on the path of what could have been with a series that does actually play more into O Ranger's original intents of the war plot and overall does end up being better written as we celebrate Power Ranger Zeo's 20th anniversary! Past the point the series would have ended 20 years ago. I am horrible with timing these reviews.